thank you all for coming. Um, small crowd, but I'm glad that you're here. Um, my name is Emily Schweik, and I am a sophomore here at the University of Maryland. And this is a project to fulfill my Honors Humanities Keystone Living Learning Program research project. So for four semesters, I've been working on this, and I'm excited to share everything with you today. So my first selection is going to be Singing in the Rain, but actually, I'm here to talk about the Faust theme in music. And as a broadcast journalism major and a women's studies minor and a music minor, I feel like sometimes my interests are all over the place. But one thing that I feel is pretty universal about all of my interests is that I love storytelling. And I love the power of sharing personal experiences through whatever medium they might be. And so tonight, that's why I'm excited to talk about three different 19th century composers who are able to tell the story of the Faust legend now, if you're here to hear about this Faust, I'm sorry, maybe a few of you know who he is, the famous deserter Nick Faust, the basketball player. Not him. This Faust has been around for hundreds of years and has inspired dozens of composers. So what is the Faust legend? The Faust legend tells of a dissatisfied scholar who sells his soul to the devil in exchange for unlimited earthly pleasures and unlimited worldly knowledge, just all of the things of the world. Was he a real guy? Well, some sources say that the Faust legend was based on the real life Dr. Johannes Faust, who was a scholar, alchemist, and magician in the German Renaissance. And notes in the journals and writings of his contemporaries suggested that he practiced the black arts. And writings by Martin Luther even suggested that the real life Dr. Faust called the devil his brother-in-law. The Faust legend was passed down orally over Historia von Johann Faustin, which was translated into the English Faust book. In 1604, Christopher Marlowe wrote Dr. Faustus. The Elizabethan play was condemned because it had a lot of controversy. It dealt with demons, it was against Calvinism, so it was quite a hot topic. But over time, the Faust legend became tattered and was eventually performed as a puppet play. So with the Faust legend reduced to simply a puppet play, a new author could take the stage, and that was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Goethe was an author and politician who served on the court of the Duke of Weimar. He wrote his play Faust over a long 30-year period, and three versions of the play remain. We'll start with a quick synopsis of the final version of the play. So in the prologue in heaven at the very beginning, the devil makes a bet with God that he can take God's favorite, most perfect human, Faust, and kind of turn him against his righteous pursuit of knowledge. Meanwhile, Faust is in his study, in despair at his fruitless attempts to gain infinite knowledge. He tries magic and attempts to commit suicide, but the sound of an Easter chorus outside changes his mind. Instead, Faust and his assistant Wagner go for a walk. I think this part is pretty funny. They run into a poodle who follows them along on the walk, who comes home and turns into the devil. Like, who would have thought the devil would be a poodle there? <laughs> Faust makes a bet with the devil, who will give him anything he wants here on earth. If Faust serves him in hell, Faust signs a contract with his own blood. And then he and Mephistopheles, the devil, go out carousing at a tavern. But Faust wants a different kind of pleasure, perhaps a gentler pleasure. So they end up next in a witch's kitchen, where Faust is going under a spell by a witch that makes him fall in love with the first female he sees. So as he's coming home, he bumps into Marguerite, a simple peasant girl on the street as she's coming back from mass. Marguerite is also called by her nickname Gretchen throughout the play and throughout the different musical excerpts that we'll listen to tonight. So it is the same person. Faust and Mephistopheles sneak into Gretchen's room and leave a box of jewels. Gretchen is so excited. She's Wow, jewels for me? She can hardly believe that Faust would love a girl who is as simple and poor and uneducated as she is. But her mother makes her get rid of the jewels because her mother is very religious and she believes that the jewels are not wholly blessed. But Faust has more plans up his sleeve. He leaves her some more jewels and then he arranges to meet her in her neighbor Martha's garden. And there he seduces and kisses her and then there's a little bit of a break. The next time we come 
come back to the characters, Faust is in the forest finding way for Gretchen, and Gretchen is sitting at her spinning wheel, lamenting that he is gone. And this is a scene that we will return through, return to a lot tonight, as it is one of the most important Gretchen soliloquies in these musical works. So next, Faust and Gretchen give Gretchen's mother some sleeping potion so Faust can come visit her at her home. But this problem, this kind of plan goes wrong when Gretchen's brother dies from too much sleeping potion. Her brother, Valentine, is a soldier, and he's got a problem with that. And he publicly confronts Faust about seducing Gretchen and killing their mother. And Faust and the devil just kill him. There's a big public confrontation, it's a big deal. So Faust leaves Gretchen goes up on a mountain and does some fun stuff with the devil. They summon some witches, and it's a little bit crazy. Meanwhile, Gretchen is in prison because she's become pregnant and drowned her illegitimate child. So she's convicted of murder. When Faust finds out that she's in prison, he tries to rescue her, but her morality is so strong that she refuses to leave. So Faust and the devil flee the dungeon as Gretchen is executed. Voices from heaven cry, she will be saved. And it's interesting because an earlier version of the play, voices cry, she will be condemned. So that just goes to show that even Goethe is wrestling with what to do with Gretchen. Meanwhile, Faust is not condemned to a physical hell, but he's forced to live in a personal one, knowing that he experienced grace through Gretchen, but he has forced to sacrifice it for his own enlightenment. So this story is a little bit all over the place. One moment we have witches, and one moment we have the devil, and the next moment we have Gretchen, but it helps to explain it to know that the story was written in three major phases, as I listed up here. The very first was the Urfaust, or the original Faust, and it was written in the 1770s, abandoned, and rediscovered years later. This version of the play was really influenced by the storm and stress period of literature. Storm and stress was a precursor to romanticism that introduced the idea of a new humanism, separated science and magic, and challenged traditional cultural establishments. It gravitated for women away from some of the lofty ideas that were in Marlowe's adaptation of the legend and focused on the humanistic elements, like the Gretchen drama. And after Goethe was appointed to the offices at Weimar, he had less time to write, so he abandoned the Urfaust, put it away for a little bit. But he came back to it in 1790, when he published Faust, in this version, he filled in some of the big gaps that were in the original Faust to better transition from Faust, the disillusioned scholar, to Faust, the young womanizer. So to do this, he added the witch's kitchen scene, where Faust takes a potion that makes him fall in love with Gretchen. And he also kind of dignified Faust, and this reflected the movement away from the romantic-ish storm and stress movement and towards classicism. So Faust kind of moved away from the magical folklore aspects and back towards the lofty ideas. In 1808, Goethe finally published Faust Part One, and Part Two was pub published after he died, but I'm gonna focus on Part One in the lecture because that's where the Gretchen tragedy happens. By then, Goethe was a leader in the Weimar classicism movement, uh, which was very popular in between storm and stress and true romantic. So, you might be wondering where the Gretchen legend itself comes from. Now, the original Faust book, the original Faust legend didn't really include the Gretchen legend, but Goethe chose to include it in his writing. There was indeed a passing mention of the Gretchen legend in the 1674 Faust chapbook, which was an early version of the legend where they spoke of a very pretty but poor servant girl whom Faust loved but he couldn't marry. Goethe could have also drawn from his personal experience in developing the character of Gretchen. As a young man, he had a passing love affair with Frederick O'Brien, a country girl who was very poor, and he wrote in his autobiography that he felt remorse for abandoning her. She ended up never marrying, which is pretty sad, so maybe to kind of make it up for her, he tried to immortalize her in literature. Another interesting aspect of the Gretchen tragedy is the infanticide, which is a very popular theme 
themed in folk literature and ballads of the time. Gretchen's act of infanticide could have been inspired by the real life execution of Susanna Margaret Reva Grant, who was beheaded in Frankfurt in 1772 for killing her infant to avoid public disgrace. She said that she was seduced and raped and drugged by a traveling goldsmith, and after killing her baby, she blamed it on the goldsmiths being under the influence of the devil. So this brought up the fact of whether infanticide was an offense that was punishable by the death penalty, so it was a very hot topic at the time. So enough about the Faust legend, let's get into the music. Why is it so attractive to composers? A lot of it is due to the Gretchen legend itself. It's very stage ready. It has a lot of interesting philosophical features, and it has a lot of human appeal. I think that all of us at some point can relate to Faust and Gretchen in the plot. So one of the first composers to set Faust to music was Franz Schubert. Schubert very publicly and openly admired Goethe, and he wrote over 80 adaptations of Goethe's texts, including five scenes from Faust. Schubert's first lead, or German art song, was written when Schubert was only 17. It is called Gretchen on Spinrad, or Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel. It is set to text from Faust when Gretchen is alone in her room at her spinning wheel. So he also wrote four other songs to scenes from Faust, but none of them really achieved the fame that Gretchen did, and I'll tell you why. One of the most notable aspects of this song is it was one of the first instances where text and music were kind of on an equal playing field. And it is also very notable for its tone painting. The piano mimics the texture of the spinning wheel moving back and forth. Ruth, could you play the piano? So as you can see, it's a little bit hypnotic, and it sounds kind of like a spinning wheel. So you have that in the higher notes in the right hand, and in the left hand you have a steady bass. And that kind of sounds like the treble that she's she's using when she's spinning. So it's kind As the song goes on, you can hear the accompaniment speed up and slow down as Gretchen becomes distracted, passionate, excited, uh, and desperate. And notice when she sings in Ach, Sein Kuss at the end, the piano cuts off and makes several attempts to start back up afterwards. And she's having trouble getting her spinning wheel started again. Schubert preserves the repeated stanzas in Goethe's poem by setting the song in rondo form, ABA. is a verse that varies a little each time. It starts out lonely, and the second verse turns into a happier sounding key as she begins to describe his positive attributes, you know, his good looks and his just winning kind of character. And in the third verse, she really goes crazy. And then the C section is kind of the bridge of the song, where she sings about his kiss. So as you listen to the song, feel free to follow along with See if you can picture a spinning wheel and think to yourself about what Gretchen looks like and how she is feeling.
So as I mentioned before, Goethe and Schubert had an interesting relationship in that Schubert, Goethe was kind of Schubert's idol, but Goethe didn't care. And so the admiration wasn't mutual. And Schubert made several efforts to share his music with the poets, but Goethe never publicly acknowledged Schubert's work. So it's unclear why Goethe ignored the music. Perhaps he never received it, it just ended up on his desk, like our internship application. <laughs> Yeah. 